The idea of being able to play a Pokemon game where you were the Pokemon always interested me, especially when I was a kid. Then in 2006, that dream became a reality with the release of Pokemon Red Rescue Team for the Game Boy Advance and Blue Rescue Team for the Nintendo DS. They released on the same day in the United States, despite being for different consoles, and I played them a ton. I didn't really know too much about how to properly play these games, and even though I spent dozens of hours playing them, I never beat them entirely. That changes today though, with the help of this official Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Strategy Guide from Prima Games. The back of the guide even says, what if you woke up one day and you were a Pokemon? Well, you would definitely need this guide then, and I guess we'll be the judges of that. Now, if you're new here, we like to look at these guides and follow them as closely as possible without using any outside knowledge of these games. We've had mixed results in the past, and this guide will be a bit different as well. The first couple of pages explain the controls, gameplay basics, how to attack, and all the things you would expect. I'm assuming most of you guys watching this video already know the general gist of how these Mystery Dungeon games work, so we can actually make our way to the walkthrough portion of this guide since we'll have to reference the intro portion of this guide a bit, as well as some things in the back of the guide while playing through the game. So let's load up our Game Boy Advance with Pokemon Red Rescue Team and beat it how Nintendo intended. The first thing we have to do is take this personality test, which tells us which Pokemon we will become. The answers you give influence which Pokemon you become, and we'll be able to use the back of the guide to help influence this quiz if we wanted to, but that's kind of lame and this chart is also a bit more complicated than it needs to be because of all the potential questions. Last time I played this game in a video, I got Cubone as my Pokemon and got made fun of for it in the comments, but this time I got Mudkip. The Pokemon you get is like your Zodiac sign in Mystery Dungeon, so please don't make fun of me too much for this. We get to choose our partner Pokemon, and I just picked Charmander since Charmander is the Pokemon that stands out to me the most on the cover of the guide, and we immediately plunge into our first dungeon mission. Butterfree is frantic because Caterpie has fallen into a hole and cannot get up. He even fell three stories down somehow, and we have to go through the tiny woods to try to find it. Here we learn the basics, get warned of the dangers in the dungeon, including executes which don't yoke around, and eventually save the lost Caterpie. Our partner Charmander is so excited that we got our first rescue and wants to form a rescue team with us, which is a big deal in this Pokemon universe. I decide to name our rescue team Subscribe because, well, just listen to Charmander there, then head back into our home and rest up. Here we have a dream because, oh yeah, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this, but in this game, you're actually a human who somehow got turned into a Pokemon and got sent to this weird Pokemon world that's not quite like the regular Pokemon world. We know it because you don't battle and have trainers and stuff and there's no humans as far as I know. It's actually not really like the core series games at all, but it's still a fun game that focuses mostly on stories and the characters, which is part of the reason why this series of games are so popular among their fans. Next, we get this ominous message from some Magnemite that's written in all caps, but they just need our help and talk in all caps for some reason. The guide says how this is really your first mission, but much like the first one, it really wasn't too hard. One thing I did notice was if you press B and A at the same time, you slowly heal. The game did tell me that, and I somehow didn't know this when I was a kid playing this game for the first time, which would have really helped me back then. Now, after saving the Magnemite, or Magneton, or maybe Magna Duo, since there was just two of them stuck together, we get a reward, then we return home, where Charmander shows us more of the area. This area next to our home is called the Pokemon Square, and the highlights include the Kangaskhan Storage Area, the Felicity Bank, the Gulpin Link Shop, where we can link two moves together to use them at the same time, kinda cool, and the Kecleon Shop to buy items. The guide even advocates for shoplifting, saying sometimes you see Kecleon Shops in the dungeons themselves and can steal from them, but you will have to fight a high-level Kecleon to get out of it, which can be difficult. It then mentions how we can use items like the Escape Orb to flee quickly after shoplifting, and you can even recruit Kecleon to your team after defeating him once stealing from him, which is rather mean. You can have up to four Pokemon on your rescue team at the same time and can store extra ones in various different areas, but befriending Pokemon to be on your team is a bit tricky, especially in the first games of the series here. In order to befriend a Pokemon, they must be KO'd by the team leader, so in our case Mudkip, must be in the tile adjacent to the Pokemon that was defeated, and we must be a higher level than them on top of the fact that some Pokemon just don't want to be befriended. 
A lot of luck is involved here, but we can take on side quests from the bulletin board near the Pelipper post office to find more Pokemon. On Blue Rescue Team for the DS, when the online servers were still up, you could have even gotten some event-only online missions, which was pretty cool. The guide also suggests we do some side missions to level up our team ourselves, so I take on the first two in the tiny woods that just require us to get to the third floor and find a berry, and if you are wondering, no, this guy doesn't have a berry page for some reason. Although berries are rather important in this game, and it does have a section for nearly every other item class in the game, but not berries. This is one of the small issues I have with the guide, although I guess it's more of an issue with the way the game works, and it's not really the guide's fault. Now I'm not talking about the lack of the berry page, I'm talking about the fact that the guide doesn't really detail any of these extra missions, even though you do have to do some of them to progress the story, aside from some of the post-game ones that it does categorize. Because of this, we won't really be needing the guide all that much, which isn't typical for a video in the series, but we'll still have fun adventuring around with our friend Charmander on the subscribe rescue team. We then have another dream, wonder what all these are about, and there is a Doug Trio in our house now. Doug Trio's baby Diglett was kidnapped and taken to Mount Steel by an evil Skarmory. The guide says how this dungeon is hard since it's 9 floors as opposed to 3 in the previous one, has ball toys with their annoying move confusion, and how there's no healing items we can find in the dungeon. We do still end up making it to the top, see the Diglett and the Skarmory that kidnapped it because it thinks that the little Diglett was causing all of these earthquakes that were keeping it up at night. Skarmory then fights us, and considering we had to use pretty much all of our healing items in the dungeon itself, I expect this to be rather difficult. And then we just win in one turn, because Charmander is super effective against it with its fire move, and the guy did recommend fire, which was kinda nice that we had a fire type. Nice. We can't exactly get the Diglett on our own, so the Magnemites that we rescued previously show up and help us rescue the Diglett, although we don't get to see them actually carrying the Diglett so we don't know what the bottom of Diglett quite looks like. Although later on, Diglett does mention something about having feet, and then Magnemite and Diglett have some sort of relationship because their evolved forms are both just three of themselves put together. When we return home, Magnemite wants to join our rescue team, but in order to do that, we have to visit Wigglytuff first. The next day, we have another dream about Gardevoir this time, which I wonder is different from any other dreams we would have had as a human. And then we head to town to see Wigglytuff. Wigglytuff allows us to have friend areas where we can store other rescue members on our team and call upon them whenever we need, kind of like a PC storage system, I guess. After that, we see a greedy shift tree who won't help this poor little jump luff because his pay is too low for the rescue mission, but the gold squad of Alakazam, Charizard, and Tyranitar come out to convince shift tree to help out the jump luff. These guys are real big shots around here. As they leave, Alakazam just looks at us and then looks away. And then the camera pans over to this sketchy looking Gengar that was watching in the distance behind a tree. And seeing how the cover of the guide has a Gengar on it looks rather evil, this probably isn't a good thing. Our next task is to visit the Sinister Woods, but first we need to do some side missions to build up our ranks. When I head outside, Team Mini appears and steals our mail, which is probably a federal offense. So I check out the shop to stock up on some items and see they're selling the stun seed, and what's the stun seed backwards? While doing some of these side missions, we encounter a Zigzagoon that joins our team too, and it really likes to throw rocks. This helped us out a bit since it threw rocks at Pokemon that were so far away before we even saw them, and knocked them out, resulting in it leveling up rather quickly. After about an hour and a half of completing all these side missions, I link together some of our moves on Mudkip and head into the Sinister Woods. Our linked attacks do a lot of damage since we just go for Tackle, Mud Slap, Growl, and Water Gun all in one turn. And in the woods we see Sudowoodos, which may have a silly name, but it's business in battle. There are a few status abnormalities here, and if we have the Master IQ skill, then statuses will be healed instantly. We don't have that skill right now, so we power through with our aggressive Zigzagoon to make it to floor 13, where we encounter Team Meanie. They threatened Caterpie when we started this mission and said that if they find the Metapod first, then they'll extort the Caterpie for money and force Caterpie to work for them. But considering we spent about four days in-game doing side missions, and still caught up to Team Meanie, they can't be very good at their job. They challenge us to a fight, and the guide says Type Trumping is the name of the game in this battle. Type Trumping, or super effective moves, only do 1.5 times damage in this game, as opposed to 2 times in the Core Series games. But between throwing rocks and Zigzagoon just being really strong for no reason, and also somehow hitting tackles on a Gengar, we defeat Team Meanie in 2 shakes of a lamb's tail and rescue Metapod. 
After that, I decide to explore around a bit and check out some other areas of the guide. I really like the world in this game and the overall art style, especially the Makuhita Dojo. Here we can fight through a small, tight-based dungeon to level up our team. I'm not sure if this is better than going through regular dungeons again, but at least we can pick a certain type that we have an advantage to. I then met with Wiggly Tough and buy up a ton more friend area so we can recruit more team members and start to wonder how we evolve Pokemon in this game. I remember having to evolve Pokemon near where Wish Cash is when I first played this game as a kid, but since I'm supposed to ignore my prior knowledge of this game, I just checked the guide and don't see much about evolution in general. The Pokedex in the back does say what level each Pokemon evolve at, and even though our Zigzagoon is level 20 and should be able to evolve, I don't know how to do it. Maybe that will be explained later in the game, or maybe it's post-game, even though I don't remember beating this game as a kid. So let's just go on to our next main task of the game, which is the Giant Chasm. Here we have to rescue Shift Tree, who disappeared while on its own rescue mission. I bring Petra Berries, like the guide suggests, to cure poison, and even befriend a Yanma on our way through. Unfortunately, the team goes down before I finish the mission, and we lose the Yanma. But our next go around, we recruit another Yanma. Yanma's pretty fast and can even fly over water, which pairs nicely with our Mudkip, who can swim. When we reach the end of the dungeon, we meet Shiftry, who looks terrified. The screen then goes black and flickers in and out, and out comes Zapdos, but not just any Zapdos, an angry Zapdos. It's so mad that it kidnaps Shiftry and takes it to the top of Mount Thunder, which we then have to climb in order to fight Zapdos and save Shiftry. Before climbing Mount Thunder, I do some side missions in Mercuda Hoot Hoot, which is useless since the next big fight is against an electric type Pokemon Zapdos. The guide said how this is not the kind of mission you want to try without a lot of experience under your belt, and a few side missions can go a long way here. There is a rest area on the 10th floor of Mount Thunder to help us out, and we get to find TMs in this dungeon for the first time, and the guide lists TM compatibility at the back of the guide for us to look at. We recruit a Glagar along the way, which helped a lot in this dungeon, alongside our trusty Zigzagoon that I bring everywhere and give rocks to so we can throw it at our foes. When we finally reach the fight against Zapdos, Zapdos was pretty scary, but Charmander's Embers and Mudkip's Water Guns, or I guess our Water Guns since we're the Mudkip, give us the win in two shakes of a lamb's tail. I really expected Mudkip to go down at least once here, but it didn't. Right as we beat Zapdos, Alakazam's team comes and is surprised that we were able to fight Zapdos all on our own and able to save Shiftry. Alakazam then tells us that he knows we're human and tells us to talk to Zatu to see if there's more we can learn about why we got turned into a Pokemon. We have to scale the Great Canyon to see Zatu first, which have some skip looms that can poison us. Muy peligroso, as the guide says. Not sure where the random Spanish came in there, but poison is really annoying in this guide because it takes 4 damage every 10 turns and 1 step in this game is equal to a turn. And the cacturns here are also really strong, but luckily Charmander handles most of them with ease. We end up fainting twice in this dungeon mainly because we don't have a great matchup against the Pokemon here. The guide always recommends types that we can use here, but since we have such little control over what Pokemon we can recruit to our team and we have to have a fire type Pokemon in our partner Charmander, and we have to have ourselves a water type mudkip, some dungeons like this one can cause us a little bit of trouble. We eventually make it to the top to tickle Zatu. Yeah, we tickled Zatu. Then it tells us how us being human and being turned into a Pokemon has something to do with natural disasters that have been happening in the world lately. Despite Zatu being all knowing and all seeing, I guess, no one, including Zatu, notices the Gengar that is standing about 20 feet behind us eavesdropping on the whole situation, which can't be a good thing. When we return home, we learn more about the Legend of the Nine Tails curse. It goes something like, if you grab one of Nine Tails' tails, you'll be cursed for a thousand years. We see Wish Cash learn more about this, and apparently this did happen to a human, but a Pokemon sacrificed themselves to the Ninetales to save its trainer from the curse. The Pokemon was a Gardevoir, and sometime later Ninetales decided to punish the trainer anyway by reincarnating the trainer into a Pokemon, which sounds a whole lot like the situation we're in right now and would explain why we see Gardevoirs in our dreams every now and then. That night we have another dream. And the next day, everyone is gathered in the center of town listening to Gengar saying they should kill us to stop all of the bad things that are happening lately because it's apparently our fault. Since we, of course, do not want to die, we have to flee and are told by Alakazam's team that every rescue team will be after us now. They are nice enough to give us a head start in running away, which leads us across the lands and into the Lapis Cave. We're forced to run in here because other rescue teams are hot on our tail. 
and we can't even bring any of our other allies, so it's just us and Charmander. We turn the town into a mob and can't return back, but at least this dungeon is rather quick and easy. After that, we have to take on Mount Blaze, and the first thing the guy says here is big dungeon. Big dungeon. Huge even. So I'm not too sure how to feel about this one, but at least we have the type advantage with Mudkip. Surprisingly though, this dungeon was a breeze for us. I got lucky on the first 13 floors and barely encountered any Pokemon, and the peak was the same, taking me under 30 minutes to do the whole thing, I expected it to be way longer. At the top we see Moltres who is pretty pissed off, and as time goes on it just gets even more pissed off and decides to fight us. We're able to cool it down with some water guns though, and then Moltres lets us pass through into the next area. This is the Frosty Forest, the exact opposite of Mount Blaze. The danger in the dungeon here includes Nose Pass, which uses Rock Throw, which is kind of a crossover move that hurts all Pokemon, especially Pokemon weak against rock moves. That was a statement indeed by the guide. And when we progress to the top, Articuno is mad at us and goes on this monologue, which really shifts the tone of this game. It starts off all silly and happy with us making friends and saving a Caterpie, and now here we are fighting against actual Pokemon gods. We lose the fight against Articuno on the first try. I then have the idea to use the Link Box item in our bag to link a couple of Trimander's moves, mainly just Ember and Metal Claw, both of which are super effective. So now it does way more damage, allowing us to hammer away at Articuno and defeat it. The guide just goes on to explain the next area, but a lot of lore happens in the game that the guide says nothing about. First, an Absol appears to convince Articuno to let us pass, then it joins our team. I definitely got at least this far when I first played through this game as a kid, since I do remember having Absol on our team as one of the very few Pokemon I recruited, but I don't remember the legendary Pokemon as much, or the fact that we're fugitives. Gardevoir then appears again, but this time in a hallucination, while we're on our way to meet with the Ninetales who can hopefully explain to us what is going on with these recent natural disasters, and can also let us know if we're the human that got cursed in the legend. Ninetale sits atop of Mount Freeze, weird spot for a Fire-type Pokemon if you ask me, which is a rather large dungeon. We got 20 floors of dungeon dig in here, with Swablus that attack us and put us to sleep. Sleep is bad in this game, according to the guide. It also tells us to save our items since there isn't going to be a big fight at the top of the dungeon. So the surprise of meeting Alakazam's team at the top isn't as scary now that I know we don't have to actually fight them. Ninetales then appears to interrupt Alakazam, letting us know more about the curse and telling us that we are not the person from the legend. Ninetales then lets us know that us being here and the curse have nothing to do with the natural disasters that have been happening lately, and they're actually being caused by a rising Groudon that Alakazam's team goes to investigate. We're now free to return home where Gengar's lies get exposed to everybody in town, and we win back the trust of the Pokemon in the village. Our next mission is called a little hanky manky in the uproar forest. Here we have some mankeys that are really angry and annoying some other Pokemon, so we have to travel to the top to defeat them. Here the guide makes note to pick up some chestnuts, a valuable item that mankeys seem to love. They can't peel them for themselves, however, as part of the reason why they're so angry is because trying to peel the chestnuts just hurt their hands and make them frustrated. We peel some of the chestnuts for them, and in exchange, they renovate our base. While this is all going down, we do some side missions, as we need to complete six more missions to take on the Magma Cavern. After completing the sixth side mission, there is another big earthquake, which is most likely caused by the Groudon. This causes Blastoise, Octillery, and Golem, three team leaders of other teams, to join up to try to save Alakazam's team since we suspect that they're in trouble. A little bit later, Blastoise, Octillery, and Golem come back defeated, and everyone else in the town is too scared to try to help Alakazam's team, but Charmander rallies us up so we can head over there to stop Groudon ourselves. The Magma Cavern was difficult, even though the guide suggested Water-type Pokemon and were a Mudkip. I lost in the first run-through, then on the second run-through we were near the end and found Charizard and Tyranitar. They were both defeated by Groudon, leaving Alakazam all alone to fight. We head up there to help Alakazam just in time for Alakazam to get defeated, and now it's our turn to fight Groudon alone. I use water moves as the guide instructed, however the sun is up so water moves are actually weakened, doing less damage than our other moves would. I do sprinkle in some mud slaps here and there, since I have been using mud slap a lot to lower accuracy for target Pokemon, and it's helped a ton. After a little while, we finally defeat Groudon and save the day, sort of. When we return to our village, we're celebrated for our victory, but then Zatu communicates with us all telepathically to warn us about a meteor that is crashing down towards us. 
Zatu says this is what has been causing the weird disasters lately, so we have to meet with Zatu the next day to prepare to stop it. The night before we head out there, we have another dream, but this time we're interrupted by Gengar who is trying to use Dream Eater on us. Gardevoir then comes down to scare off Gengar, as Gardevoir tells us that the reason why we returned to a Pokemon and sent to this world was to save the world from this very meteor. The next morning, Zatu gives us a teleportation gem made by Zatu, Alakazam, and some ghost-type Pokemon that could have been Gengar. Gengar being involved with this is a little bit worrying, but this looks like it'll be our last adventure with Charmander, since victory means our job in this world is done. This is by far the longest dungeon in the game, and here's what the guide has to say about this. The fate of the world is in your hands, and as you travel through the Sky Tower, you have to survive 34 floors of dungeon dancing. Rayquaza is on the 9th floor of the peak, but it is a formidable fight, so make sure you have restorative items. Huge apples and big apples are going to be a standard fare because of the length of the dungeon. I did have to eat like 20 gummies while going through this. And since some of the Pokemon can actually pass through walls to get you, this will be your toughest challenge yet. Make sure your levels are sufficiently high enough to sustain the long trekking ahead. Long trekking it was indeed, and while we're going through it, we encounter a Shuppa that we befriend that helps us along the way, but it ends up falling along with our friend Absol before we reach the top. We're out of Reviver Seeds, super low on orange berries and other good items, and still have to go through the 9 peak floors of the dungeon which are the hardest in the game. There's Aerodactyls, Flygons, and Salamences here doing massive damage on top of annoying Shedinjas we can barely hit. Since we're able to save right before the peak, losing twice here wasn't that bad since instead of starting from the very bottom, we only have to do the last 9 floors all over again. We're finally able to persevere to the top and meet none other than Rayquaza. This isn't a jolly Team Sky meeting with Rayquaza or anything like that since Rayquaza is out for blood. I link all of our moves together on Mudkip to do as much damage as possible since Rayquaza has 600 HP. By comparison, our moves against Pokemon in this dungeon did about 40 to 50 damage each attack, so 600 is quite a lot. By some miracle, we're able to take out Rayquaza in the first battle, but the job isn't over yet. The meteor is still falling, and the only way to stop it is if Rayquaza uses Hyper Beam on it, but since we're so close to it, there's a chance we're gonna get hurt. Rayquaza goes for Hyper Beam on the Meteor, the screen goes white, and Gengar begins dragging us around. It seems like Gengar was up to something here, but eventually we wake up and realize that Gengar actually saved us from the explosion. I wonder if part of the reason Gengar decided to help was because he saw our dreams and overheard Gardevoir say that we're here to save his world. All of our friends from the village then appear and congratulate us. But it's rather bittersweet as we have to leave this world now as our job is finished. Charmander is heartbroken and the rest of the town begins to weep since we left such a strong impression on them. We fade into the sunset, then credits roll, meaning we beat Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Red Rescue Team how Nintendo intended thanks to this official guide. This took longer than most of my other Nintendo videos, but this game was still a lot of fun. It did get a bit repetitive at time, and the guide itself was pretty good. I imagine that making a guide for this game is pretty difficult since the dungeon layouts are different every time you run through them. I do still think it's weird how the guide didn't really mention that many major story events that change how you would play the game like befriending Absol after the Lapis Cave. The guide for the main story itself was only about 15 pages, but it does still cover the post game which we won't be doing. The post game also doesn't really make a lot of sense because we sort of just appear back in this world and nobody really questions anything. Making this video did make me appreciate the Mystery Dungeon series a bit more though because of its overall charm, especially since I don't really remember too much about this game when I first played it as a kid. But after beating the game, it made me realize that I definitely did beat this game as a kid since I do remember doing some of the post game missions that the guide details. I can definitely see why people love this series so much, and maybe we can look at another game in this series in a future Nintendo video.